You all good there? Set it going? Okay, good. Um, good friends, good morning uh, and welcome. It's a great day, this Feast of the Presentation of Jesus in the Temple. Uh, this is when the parents come and have the clergy bless uh, children in the Jewish tradition. Um, and they receive sometimes, you know, a name, uh, and they receive a, 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 their purpose, their mission. And uh, you can see the proud young parents of Jesus, and before they even get to the ceremony, people are um, interdicting them, they're, they're coming up to them. Uh, Simeon, who was an old man, probably as old as I am. <laughs> I, I, I'm starting to have this real identification with Simeon. Um, and Anna. And uh, their statements are not included in Torah. Their statements to uh, Jesus' mother and daddy are rather profound and very powerful. Prophetic statements about who this child will be and what he will do. Hear the innermost thoughts of many. And as he does that, Simeon says to Mary, like any mother, uh, you will feel a sword pierce your heart. So, uh, I, I think it's a great day for a baptism. Uh, I think it's a great day to share with you uh, the things I have to say. Um, amazingly, we actually were able, last Sunday, to hold our 46th annual parish meeting in the sermon time of the service. We actually, something new and different for our church, had a quorum, which means we could conduct our one business meeting of the entire year uh, on your behalf. We elected uh, some new vestry members. We, uh, uh, Jordy's here with us this morning. We uh, gave, I gave Bonnie Marlette the rector's cross. Have somebody else, a second recipient, will wait till they come back into town. Um, we talked about all the blessings. Um, as I look back over 2019, it was a remarkable year in ways that we did not expect. The theme of, uh, the ministry theme for 2019 at our church was, uh, does anybody remember the ministry theme? Oh, Sue, join us on the journey. Thank you, Sue. It was a journey. Uh, we were astounded. When we counted everything up, and I'm proud to share with you that our little church served over 20,000 total worshipers last year. That's amazing. We baptized 14 souls into the body of Christ. And I want to tell you, this is rare for Episcopal churches, so you can be proud of this. This is the 20th year last year where we baptized more people than we buried. This is a marker of health for any congregation. Can I tell you that you have generated baby Jesus every year for a pageant from inside the church for the past 20 years. This is church growth the fun way. Oh, it's awesome. And we have baby Jesus on retainer for this December already booked. Now that's just super cool. Uh, it's such an energetic vibrant feeling to host our children and to welcome them and to fuss over them and worry about them and uh, pay attention to them. More on that in a moment. We buried, I think it was, uh, how many of them? Seven. Seven. It felt like seven. We baptized yeah, we baptized 14, we buried seven. Now here's what's interesting. Uh, some subsection of those seven were people that were not members of our church. They came to our church out of the 23 congregations in the valley and asked us to conduct their memorials. We could not have done this without them. These were significant moments of, of communal change and transition. 10th Mountain Division, long time ranch owner, Pepe Gramsheimer, and others whom we love. 
Dick Duday. These are people that have changed and elevated our community. And we had the privilege of hosting the final time of saying goodbye to people that we love. And I am profoundly humbled by that. Can I tell you that uh, last year we hosted, under Rebecca Cotton, a mission trip from kids, high schoolers across Colorado, almost 50 of them, here in this chapel. They chose to come here to work for their summer mission experience. And our church and our youth ministry team hosted and organized the entire thing. Very, very proud of that. I hope you are too. Can I tell you that uh, we celebrated 45 years as a congregation. The church should have closed two or three times. Can I tell you that we watched history in Denver this uh, this summer, or, or spring, actually, when Bishop Ken Lucas, she's the third African-American woman ever consecrated uh, in, in the Anglican Communion around the world. The third one, and she is our new bishop. And I will tell you, she is uh, reorganizing the spiritual furniture as we speak in Denver. Very energetic, very exciting. Can I tell you that, um, we had, well, Christmas and Easter and all that, we had this year, at the end of the year, we were sweating it, as you know, because I talked about it. We had the largest single month of income in December of 2019 that we have had in 45 years in the history of this period. You were so generous in December that we received more income in the month of December than the total annual budget the first six years I served the church. Everybody with me? And it allowed us to fully fund our youth ministry for this year. It allowed us to give 2%, 2% cost of living raises to a staff that works incredibly hard. And I am so grateful for your generosity. Thank you. And JP gets to hear that once they're back. Happy welcome back. Um, and I tell you what, I will ask JP, who's our pledge chair, to draw his sword, his Marine officer's sword, every year. Wow. What a blessing. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It allows us that generosity to look forward and to ask what God's calling us to this year. This year's ministry theme is Live Love. It's very short, but do not mistake brevity for profundity. It's very profound, at least to me. Our ministry theme is Live Love. As an adult, as your priest for all these years, I have never been in a moment where we need to live love more in this church than right now. As the rest of the world happily carves itself up, we are called to something higher and different and better. My commitment to you this year is to challenge myself to love you in a deeper and a more patient and a more gentle way than I ever have before. And I'm asking you to join me. People do not come back to this church because of Emily or myself or where the bathrooms are or what I say or what we say in a sermon. They come back to this church because within studies tell us 92 seconds they have a body feeling about whether they are welcomed and it's safe or whether this is a scary place and they should turn around and run. 92 seconds is what we get. That's not about us. That's about you and how we treat each other. I love you. And my commitment is to love you more in a deeper way. I think we all need to be very cautious 
and focus on how we treat each other now. One of the most exciting things, something that Denise is leading, <coughs> is shepherds. Emily and I are far too busy to, to, to kind of be running around all the time. We are running around all the time. We're running around responding to phone calls, like yesterday, like this morning, and all of the pastoral challenges and the health challenges. Shepherding is different. Shepherding are lay people, and perhaps it's Emily and Denise. Yes, the, they're here. Yeah. Thank you. Lay people that have volunteered to call you once every, once a quarter, four times a year. It's not a pledge call. Just don't hang up and meet her. It's not a call because we think you're sick or something's wrong. It's a call to check in and say, hey, how are you? What's going on? And so there are wonderful lay people that are just going to knock on the door and verbally and just check in on the schedule. I think this is one of the most exciting things we've ever done. We would like to pray a little bit more robustly. We'll talk more about this as the year unfolds. Not only for all the things that are going on that are hard and difficult. I notice sometimes in church we have a lot of hard and difficult. But I'd like to pray, we'd like to pray for you just because you're here. Just because we love you. Just because. How we treat each other, how we care for each other, how we pray for each other is very significant right now to us. You're going to see a change in my title on these uh, redesigned mountain notes. I am the rector and senior pastor. I feel like Simeon. 55 and a half years old, I think I've got the senior part down. So I'm feeling senior. So that is a new title, rector and senior pastor. I'm going to be the field officer. I'm going to try to spend more time with you and less time in operational matters in the church. I'm going to try and be out in the community more, with our interfaith partners more, with you more. Emily's new title is Vicar. It is an Anglican word that conveys increased responsibility. Emily's gifting is looking at systems and making them run incredibly better than I do. In fact, that's not even the right bar, just incredibly better. Uh, vicar implies, when I'm not here, that Emily uh, exercises rectoral authority, and that's correct. It also implies she exercises rectoral authority if I am here. Um, Emily is going to be overseeing, minding the store. E even and more, it preaching is the same, leadership from the altar is the same. This is where our gifting is, and we're trying to pay attention to that. Everybody with me? Yeah. Um, that's really important. We have the best staff in the world. You have the best church staff I've ever worked with. And I just want to tell you, uh, we're, we're going to uh, all work together even more. Um, let's talk about the challenges uh, this year. Um, Oh, Mike Williams, June 20th, Cathedral in Denver. We have received now enough assurances that we know Mike Williams will be ordained as a deacon by Bishop Kim Lucas on June 20th in the morning, Saturday, at St. John's Cathedral in Denver. It's going to be a big wing, hoo-ha, Anglican, Episcopal worship fest. And I just said that on YouTube. And we want you to come and celebrate. There's a, there's, it's great worship down there. We want you to come and celebrate. The very next day, June 21st, Sunday, Mike will be installed in Vail and here, and he will take his place on this altar as the third parish deacon of this church. And it cannot come fast enough. He is studying daily <coughs> to serve us. 
and I am so excited. We will be restored on the altar since Steve's death to a three clergy team that we desperately need. Thanks, Peter. That's going to be mid here. Here's what's happening right now. Rebecca Smith is here. Yay! Uh, Rebecca, would you wave your hand? Everybody say hello to Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Why are we waving to Rebecca? Rebecca is starting, like today. We could get a few things organized. Um, Rebecca is starting as our youth ministry coordinator. She is an architect in town. We cannot hire her full time, kind of ask, but no, we can't do that. Rebecca will be serving our youth part time as a youth ministry coordinator. She will be a bridge between Rebecca Cotton and we are going to conduct a national search for a youth minister. Why am I saying this? Because our kids in this community are in crisis. I have heard and I've done some research myself. I heard with Denise at the hospital. Um, I want to tell you, the second leading cause of death nationally for teenagers, 10 years old, upwards of 35, they took the metric all the way to 35, is suicide. Second leading cause of death nationally. We live, did you know, in what's called now the suicide belt. I didn't know that. Did you? Montana to New Mexico features some of the highest rates of suicide in the country. In 2018, Eagle County registered, um, let's see, 17 suicides. That percentage per 100,000 citizens places Eagle County in the highest county in the nation percentage-wise for suicide. Last year, 2019, we dropped 30%. 11 suicides. Um, that is profoundly disturbing. Here's what's even more disturbing. The Healthy Kids Colorado Survey, one-third of our local youth, one-third, and I think this is underreported, are depressed or receiving medication for depression or anxiety. I had a recent distinguished surgeon in Denver tell me, as a parent of a 16-year-old girl, which I am, oh, every female student on the front range should automatically be on medication. That's the crisis that he is looking at. One-fifth, this is our own survey, one-fifth of students have contemplated suicide or made a plan to kill themselves. I think it was probably higher here, wasn't it? It was, a little, it was almost one-fourth in Eagle County. That means anywhere you go now, you look around anywhere in the county, and you count a fourth of teenagers, and they have actively considered ending their you're going to hear me say this. This is the reality of the world that we are in. And we have to respond. We have to respond. Your generosity made it possible for us to fully fund a youth ministry program to have a voice that stands against this kind of darkness. And there are several of you, and I love it when you do it, if anybody wants to act like anybody in the church, Oh, boy, is he going to be upset. I want you to act like Dick Gilbert. Dick Gilbert will not let a teenager through this door without engaging them in some kind of conversation where he looks them in the eye and somehow he conveys the love of God. I didn't tell Dick I was going to say this. It's beautiful. And we should all be doing that every Sunday. And every time you see our kids anywhere, stop them. I have a teenager, I promise you. Stop them, look at them in the eye, and ask how they are. We've got a youth minister and a youth ministry coordinator, but the ministry to our youth is all of our responsibility. We've got to do better. Now. Period. If your grandchildren are somewhere else, 
trust me. They're, they're talking about this too. When Chris Lindley gave this presentation, and he was asked how to get, in his words, upstream of vaping and, um, and all of this, he was talking about interdicting these disturbing challenges in second and third grade. Because by fourth grade, they're already hitting. He went and visited every school in this county, closed the door, sat with the students, and this is his assessment. I'm spending time on this because you're going to hear me. It's significant that we have Rebecca Smith. But we have a youth ministry program because we have youth that need us right now. And it's on my heart. And I hope it's on yours. Don't let a young person out of this church, please, without walking up and saying, Hi, my name is... Who are you again? Please. What I said to the children, I meant with all of my heart. In the Gospel, Luke tells us that Jesus had the privilege to grow in the strength and the knowledge of the Lord because he was safe enough to Kids need to be safe enough to simply have the privilege of growing up here. The last place that I would like to live love this year is with our interfaith partners in all three interfaith chapels. This chapel is 10 years old this fall. I can't believe it. 50 years for the Vail Chapel. 40-something years for Beaver Creek. I would like to spend some time, you're going to hear and see me spending some time raising money and awareness for our interfaith chapels. The Vail Library, Vail Health, the Gerald R. Ford Amphitheater, the Valar Center, all of our schools have all upgraded, and the only people that have not upgraded the facility are the interfaith chapels. And we need to so you're going to see me spending some time and energy on all three chapels in the coming year. They're incredibly important to our community. You know that already. So friends, this is the year that I see to live love in a very disciplined, in a very passionate way. Uh, this is God presenting all of us, in a sense, to grow strong in the knowledge and the love of the Lord. A blessed 2020 to all of you. I'm so excited to take this journey. Amen.